Thanks for joining us. We're going to wait a minute or two for more people to join. Hi everyone, this is Patty and Rado with HIMSS and today I'm with Ram Swaminathan, CEO of Buddy AI. We're going to talk about a variety of topics um, on AI and we hope our discussion spurs interest in some great questions from you, our audience. So welcome, Ram. Thanks for having me here. Great. So let's start off with, you know, a brief primer on all of these acronyms that are associated with AI and machine learning. So first of all, you know, what do these AI phrases mean? So, you know, I'll go down this list. Supervised machine learning. Supervised machine learning is a technique uh, of uh, mapping a certain kind of an input with an output based on uh, some example input output pairs, if you will. Um, so as an analogy to healthcare, you know, for example, if you were to automate medical coding, you know, if you were to actually map a certain kind of a, a clinical phrase uh, as an input to actually uh, an output in this case would be a diagnosis code or a procedure code. Uh, this mapping, which is actually done in a supervised way by an expert uh, is, is what we call a supervised machine learning. Okay, great, thanks. And how about unsupervised machine learning? So unsupervised uh, is, is a technique which is uh, essentially looking for previously undetected patterns in a, in a data set with no pre-existing labels, uh, which is uh, you know, not annotated, if you will. Um, and uh, this is another uh, situation where you, you know, uh, at Buddy, we actually use unsupervised techniques to let's say uh, segregate diagnosis codes versus actually procedure codes um, by uh, the uh, means of actually understanding you know, the context uh, of the data with absolutely no labels. Great. And how about distributed versus federated machine learning? So those are new techniques which are coming in. Uh, distributed uh, you know, uh, ML uh, or machine learning process is actually is to kind of uh, fasten the process of um, the, uh, the model building effort uh, by getting all the data uh, into a central location and uh, uh, essentially distribute the model building across numerous uh, you know, nodes, if you will, on GPU, GPU clusters so that okay, you, can, you can cut down the time of actually uh, the models being built. Um, federated model is actually is more a decentralized model, if you will, um, where you essentially uh, have the data locally, but you just export uh, just the parameters of the models um, uh, to uh, reduce the time. Great, and how about active learning? So active learning is a, is a very exciting uh, model uh, building effort where uh, it essentially can interactively use the, uh, the domain expert, uh, you know, in the case of a medical coder or a medical biller, um, actively giving us inputs in terms of actually uh, correcting the machine uh, in terms of actually an addition, deletion, uh, you know, modification. Now, those new inputs, which the, the, the end user, who is a domain expert, has given to the system is actively being used by the model to train the system to not make the mistake again. Okay, and our last term, transfer learning. So transfer learning is, a, is another uh, uh, newly evolved uh, concept where uh, it focuses on storing knowledge gained while solving one problem and applying it to a completely different problem not related uh, to the problem. Um, I'll give you an example. Now you have BERT models, which has actually been released by Google. Um, you have uh, the GPT-3 uh, models, which have actually been released. Now, uh, what if, let's say, uh, 
you know, uh, a machine learning company could actually borrow some of those models and transfer that to a different problem statement that you're trying to solve. Uh, but the, the original models were being trained on, on data sets uh, might be a little different, but that transfer of that learning is, is what we call it as transfer learning. UI. Okay, great. So what's the difference between RPA, robotic process automation or bots and um, AI and machine learning? So um, RPA uh, and bots have kind of evolved. And, and I, I think uh, um, in a nutshell, we are, we are talking about a machine which is smart enough to automate mundane tasks, which are you know kind of repeated, uh, almost repetitive mundane tasks, if you will, um, by understanding and learning from what the end user is performing, let's say in the case of let's say a payment posting, in the case of a billing or you know uh, some kind of a form filling process, which is actually repetitive, uh, more like a UI automation, if you will, with with a, a rule engine which is actually might be powering the RPA or bot. Um, and, and, and that's the definition of RPA bot. And was your question actually, was it, uh, did you ask me what's the difference? Right, yep. Right, the, the difference between RPA bots from uh, AI is AI dives into the context of the content. So if you have a clinical medical record coming in from an EMR, or you have a claims data or an EOB data, which is actually coming in from the billing system, the contextual understanding of what this, uh, you know, this clinical medical record actually even means is not something the RPAs and bots can do. But RPAs and bots have a place in terms of automation for more repetitive mundane tasks, if you will. And that's the fundamental difference between AI-based approach and an RPA bot-based approach. Okay, great. So now let's tackle some of the myths surrounding AI and machine learning, you know, specific to healthcare and help us debunk them one by one. So um, the first myth is large clinical and claims data sets plus brilliant data scientists are always a recipe for success. Right, and I think that's been debunked uh, by, by numerous, uh, you know, uh, uh, teams. And the reason why uh, this uh, large data sets and, and smart data scientists uh, alone could actually um, you know, kind of move the needle in terms of the precision um, or, or, the, or, or, or even the recall, you know, uh, parameters uh, in the case of healthcare is because you need a lot of domain experts to actually annotate those medical records and get to the context of each of those nuances in every specialty and modalities under each of those specialties. So um, having just large data sets and really smart data scientists just doesn't move the needle. And a classic example is uh, GPT-3. Um, we just recently saw an incredible article um, by uh, a team of, uh, you know, uh, uh, physicians and uh, uh, very brilliant machine learning, you know, engineers who really uh, try to understand what GPT-3 can do and cannot do. And they very quickly actually, you know, put it to test to a lot of healthcare scenarios, all the way from trying to understand benefits you know, uh, you know, uh, information from you know an eligibility response, or trying to actually get a, a you know a registration you know uh, chat going on with a patient, and very they, they quickly understood that uh, the machine is not able to understand the context. Uh, it's not able to get the time context, or in some cases the clinical context, and all of that is because it doesn't have an expert uh, who's actually annotating, helping building that context. So I think that's actually definitely debunked. Okay, so natural language processing alone delivers contextual understanding of medical records. Um, tell us about debunking that myth. Right, so I think that's a classic myth, um, which uh, we definitely have been uh, trying to educate our customer base and uh, uh, the community around us. Um, because NLP is, 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 a, is a process which is, the, is, is a natural language processing um, you know, uh, algorithms is like a, a, a has fourteen different sub sub algorithms, like uh, trying to uh, identify, let's say, where a sentence you know ends, you know, uh, uh, you know, and there's a whole bunch of you know algorithms underneath NLP. Now, what NLP really does is essentially it tags uh, or annotates um, a, a phrase or a word or a numeric, um, for example, if it's a procedure or a condition or is it a normal state. Um, is it an equipment? Is it a, is it a body part? Um, so you can go on and on with, with almost thousands of clinical named entities is what we call them uh, with on a, on a medical record or, 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 or let's say on a claims data set. Um, now in this process, what NLP really does, it semi-structures 
an otherwise unstructured medical record, um, uh, or rather even you know a semi-structured data you get from an EMR in the case of uh, you know CCDAs uh, or XML form data set that you get from an Epic or a Stern or an Athena kind of EMR systems. Um, but the context is just not still there in an NLP because you only have a whole bunch of you know, uh, uh, phrases and, and words getting tagged. The next step is the graph. The graph really what? The knowledge graph really weaves the, the correlations between the first paragraph and the second, third, fourth paragraph. Um, the relationship building, all of that is done in the, in, the, in the form of a knowledge graph and that gives you context. NLP is the stepping stone to the context, but that alone is not the context. Okay, so um, I know we only have 10 minutes left, so I want to move on to, you know, use cases for AI and machine learning and revenue cycle management. So, you know, how does AI and revenue cycle management help providers in this current pandemic? Right, so um, the, we are unfortunately in one of the worst pandemics uh, in our lifetimes, and uh, AI could actually help automate medical coding uh, and medical billing 70% uh, or above the volumes they're facing today at a 30% reduction of cost with you know, retaining the accuracies of the human or higher um, and thereby giving you the savings which is much required by the top 100 hospitals in America, which is actually, you know, uh, have complained that they're losing more than you know, $1.3 billion a, a day. Um, so a large hospital, a medium-sized hospital, a small hospital or a clinic, all of them want cost savings today. And AI could deliver that with production worthy accuracies by automating you know, some of these code functions in ref cycle like coding and billing uh, by retaining the accuracy as well. Okay, so how does NLP combined with clinical contextual graph assist in eliminating, in eliminating medical coding or medical necessity related denials? Right, um, when you have a contextual way of understanding the clinical note, you have an evidence-based coding. Now, when you have an evidence-based coding, it automatically takes care of, of a, a lot of the uh, denials that you might see on the coding side and on the medical necessity side. And uh, of course, you need to have a large rule set, you know, which you have already codified, you know, based on the Medicare and Medicaid AMA guidelines. Um, so uh, the evidence-based uh, approach that we take using a knowledge graph approach really actually moves the needle. Uh, in terms of lowering these, uh, you know, both these kind of denials. Okay, great. So I'm going to move on to, you know, talking about, you know, you know, what AI can do to resolve today's greatest issues with the future, and that's the hospital of tomorrow. So in a post-pandemic world, how can AI build tomorrow's hospital? You know, where would AI be asserting itself in the process? So the pandemic has exposed a lot of uh, cracks in our system, uh, especially in the public health system uh, we are faced with in America today. Um, a lot of areas, for, for example, a patient from New York goes to California, the California system doesn't, under, uh, doesn't know a lot of the data sets uh, for some of these out of state patients. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of these situations can be uh, dealt really well if we can actually uh, apply um, a, a lot of these, you know, uh, aggregation, summarization kind of technologies uh, using AI, where we can actually help you know, uh, state level departments, you know, understand, you know, uh, a patient's allergies, patient's uh, historical data sets from an, uh, you know, uh, uh, an out of state patient um, very quickly so that a, a physician who's going in rounds can actually quickly understand, you know, if a patient is allergic to a certain drug or not, and what was the last used drug at what time. So all of this information, I think AI could actually completely eliminate some of these prom statements, uh, which we are faced with today um, in a pandemic situation. Uh, and, 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 and the context, again, coming back to this context, context is gonna be the, the true winner uh, in helping, you know, uh, uh, you know, in a situation like uh, uh, what we are faced with uh, to help the, the, the amount of triage time for every physician. Okay, great. I'm gonna have one more question for you before we go to questions from the audience, but let's reimagine the EMR of the future. So what role does AI play in the hospital setting for the next generation of the EMR? Well, in a, in, a, in a nutshell, the word EMR would actually have to be reimagined with a contextual medical record versus an electronic medical record. I think that's gonna be the paradigm shift what we uh, at Buddy actually are looking at the future and figuring out how can we build this layer of contextual you know, uh, lake, if you will. Uh, because traditionally the industry has been looking at data uh, going from one container to another container. With that, you're just taking the problem 
from one container to another container. What we are trying to reimagine the future of healthcare with a contextual link, if you will, on top of all the EMRs, so that actually the data is seen as a context that way, we kind of driving down 20 to 30% of labor efforts in America in healthcare. So it's a paradigm shift. It's going to drive down the cost. It's going to improve efficiencies and it's going to improve outcomes as well. Great. So our first question from the audience is, um, could you elaborate on the top commercial use cases for NLP, text-based machine learning and healthcare? Um, yeah, I mean, so for example, you know, NLP could help explain to the patient, um, you know, what their uh, invoice or the bill they got from the, uh, the clinic or the hospital. So explaining the bill, uh, which could be very complicated sometimes for a patient to understand, NLP and graph could actually help the, the patient understand the bill. Um, in the case of physicians, uh, NLP and, and graph could help uh, almost in real time, can help them the voids in their documentation, because unfortunately, you know, we still document for medical codes uh, to be reimbursable. And uh, you know, if the documentation is not complete, the coding cannot be done. And hence, AI, ML, uh, you know, the NLP graph technologies can definitely help physicians to actually you know, quickly fix some of those documentation issues in real time versus going through this lab laborious CDI queries, which is going back and forth and it takes more than a few days. Diagnosis um, you know, is a decision support area is another huge area where the differential diagnosis situation can also be dealt with uh, with some of these technologies that we're talking here. Um, and it, the list is endless. For example, summarization is, a, is an example. Deduplication is an example of how NLP and machine learning could help uh, in solving. Um, uh, De-identification uh, or PHI de-identification or redaction is another example of how we could use medical coding automation is a classic example, how we could use NLP and machine learning. There's numerous you know, use cases in healthcare where we can deploy NLP and graph technology. Okay, great. Um, so how does Buddy AI differ from other AI companies like C3.ai? Right, um, well, there's a generalist. You have the, 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 the top cloud companies like you know, Azure, you have you know, AWS, you have C3. Um, all of them is what we call them as generalist. You have generalist AI companies which are in multiple verticals but then you have the specialist AI companies like us, which is actually married to healthcare. And the reason why the community should actually make a, a huge distinguishing factor between these two companies is because um, in healthcare, a classic example, again, going back to the GPT-3, GPT-3 model was built on 175 billion you know, parameters, something which actually no human has ever built anything more complex than this. And that model fails in healthcare. Uh, uh, but when you compare that with the specialist models that at Buddy that we build, um, we annotate um, you know, millions and millions of medical records. We have not the 40 million that we've been training and the number is increasing by the day. Um, that annotation at the modality level for every specialty, uh, and if you take radiology, you, know, you take the mammograms or x-rays, you know, uh, MRI, CT scans, you, you take all of those modalities and you customize that annotation and you curate the NLP at, at that granular level combined with the rule engine, uh, which is built by the experts, you know, the coders and the billers uh, and the clinicians, if you will. And, and, and that combination is really what is, gonna, is giving us the high precision and recall. Um, and that's the huge differentiation, right? C3s and the AWS and the Azures of the world are, are not just doing that. Great, thanks so much, Ram. And, and thank you for joining our live fireside chat today. You know, up next are other live chat with the speaker sessions available through the listed options. And we hope to see you there. For any questions that we didn't answer, Ram will reach out to those as a follow-up. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having me.